All right, so Matt, I don't know if you've heard about this, but scientists recently discovered what they say is the smartest dinosaur that ever lived. They they said it actually could speak in in a way, you know, in some communication level between dinosaurs. And like, it, like Dino on the Flintstone? Yeah, and it actually knew a lot of words, which I'm not entirely sure how they figured that out, but they did call it the thesaurus. <laughs> I, saw, I saw it coming. <laughs> Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the graveyard. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Adam. And my name's Matt. Now, pull up a tombstone or settle into your casket and get comfortable because this is Graveyard Tales. All right, everybody, here we are again. Matt, how you doing tonight, brother? Hey, I'm doing okay. How about you? I'm doing good. I cleaned up my desk before we started recording here, so it's not perfect, but I've got a lot more arm room this episode than I did last episode. So It's like I had old McDonald's cups and, you know, <laughs> yeah. papers and, you yep. know. Co- coffee ring stain on a notebook you oh, know, dude. Sit there you have no idea how many sticky notes i've got around it's like editing notes i'll write on a sticky note and stick to the desk and then on another note oh episode topic and i write that down a sticky note it and like last episode i had about this much space just for my uh tablet to fit in <laughs> here and there's a reason why my video doesn't go any lower than this i don't want you seeing my nasty desk so <laughs> it looks good right now, but uh, give it a week I, of editing and researching and it'll be completely covered again. Way back when I used to tell people not to leave sticky notes on my desk because I don't come to my desk often enough mm-hmm. to catch a sticky note. Right. And they didn't stop. So I would just leave them. Yeah. Okay. So I had all these sticky notes all (laughs) over from like years ago. People are like, what, what are you doing? All these sticky notes. I said, I don't do anything with them. I said, people come and stick them on my desk and I just leave them alone. Yep. (laughs) When I was, um, when I was a supervisor at the factory, I, um, had a desk upstairs, but like you, I was hardly ever at my desk. I was a floor supervisor, so I had to be on the floor most of the day. And I, I might come up to my desk to do reports in the afternoon and some reports in the morning. Or if I knew I had an urgent email from the boss, I'd run up to my desk. But like you, people would leave me sticky notes, but they would stick them on my monitor. So I would see them. And usually I just peel it off and throw it in a pile and do what I had to do and then walk back down and somebody would be like, hey, did you get my note? No. Well, I left it on your desk. Okay, how often do you think I'm there? Text me. You know, call me. Something. So, yeah. If it's somebody else leaving me a sticky note, it doesn't do me any good. But if it's me, it doesn't do me any good. Because I still don't read it. <laughs> that makes you feel better. Yeah, exactly. To all of all of you who feel like you have been slighted because I didn't see your sticky note, I don't see my own sticky notes. So, don't worry about it. <laughs> So real quick, we want to say go check out the Podbelly Network at podbelly.com. You can find some different shows to listen to and some different tricks and tips on recording. And, you know, you might find some shows that you never thought were out there. If you go search podbelly.com and look for them, good network to be a part of. Um, We also want to thank tonight's sponsors, Magic Spoon, Best Fiends, and Lucy. And we'll talk a little bit more about them here in a little bit. While you're on the Internet, Go over to patreon.com slash graveyard tales and you can become a patron. We've got a one, a five and a ten dollar group that you can sign to sign up to be a part of. And you get different bonus things for, you know, depending on which group you are, you might get something different as a bonus Um, for our ten dollar members. You get ad free video versions of us recording this podcast. So. Those of y'all that uh, are $10 patrons, I'm waving at you now. 
Um, you can watch us do it, and then you can make the comment, like I've seen several times here lately. Um, the faces don't match the voices. <laughs> yep, I know. Still, we still get that. I know, I know. And either people transpose our voices and faces, um, mm-hmm. or they just go, "No, it's not what I thought you looked like at all." And I mean, I get that. <laughs> I, when yeah. I oh, when yeah. I listen to podcasts, I don't envision the people that I'm hearing like it doesn't fit. I'm just yeah. always curious when people hear me talk, what do they think I look like? Like they never say what they think I look like. They just go, Oh, your, your voice doesn't match your face. Well, please continue. I want to know what you think I look like. <laughs> you know, we need to get like a composite sketch of, of what people think we look like. That would be cool. Based on our voices. So yeah. How different it was from what we really look like. Exactly. So if you're an artist, that's something we got uh, for you to do. What, Draw what you think we look like, and then next to us, and we can put, you know, the real us and the the vocal <laughs> us or something like that. <laughs> the expectation reality. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, but also, while, while you're on the internet and you're signing up to become a patron, we recently just started an account on Rumble. So if you don't know what Rumble is, Rumble is similar to YouTube in a way um, where you can post videos, watch videos from creators and stuff like that. And we wanted to go ahead and jump on the Rumble thing. So we've got uh, we've got an account, Graveyard Tales podcast. Go over there, search it up, find us. You can follow us and we're going to be posting our videos there like we do on YouTube. Now, the reason we're doing that is because Rumble has a thing now where you can monetize at any spot. It's not like YouTube where you have to have a certain amount of followers, a certain amount of uh, listening hours and stuff. It's kind of like YouTube used to be back in the old days where you put it up and it's monetized. So every watch on Rumble helps us out. It, mm-hmm. It's like going and patronizing our sponsors where if if you go and buy something from them or whatever it helps us out because they come back and then they pay for an ad spot well rumble if you go and listen to our episode on rumble rather than youtube then rumble we will get a monetary value for that so um, just being upfront honest with you guys that's why we're doing it on rumble and we wanted to get a jump on the Rumble thing. It's newer. Um, I know people have had a Rumble account for a while, but it's new to us. And we're always trying to get the graveyard out to as many people as we possibly can. We we tell you all that all the time. That's why we ask for ratings and reviews on iTunes, because it makes us more searchable. People can find the graveyard. And we're always trying to expand the graveyard. So Rumble is another outlet for us where we can expand the graveyard and we can bring people, rumblers, into the graveyard as well. So if you have a Rumble account, go over there and follow us, Graveyard Tales Podcast on there. If you don't have Rumble, hey, go sign up. It, you know, yeah. there there's videos and stuff you can watch on there. Not just us, but you may you may enjoy it. So go... Go sign up for Rumble and go find us and follow us and you can listen to our episodes on there. And we may put up, who knows, we haven't figured this out, but we may put up Rumble exclusives on there. You never know. So go follow us and that way you can be the first to know if we do decide to start doing Rumble exclusives. Okay, Adam, let's take a minute and talk about one of tonight's sponsors, Magic Spoon. Now, for me, growing up, cereal was one of the the four food groups. Okay? <laughs> right. I had, I had everything else, and then I had cereal. Now, for me, cereal could be breakfast. It could be after school snack. Um, you know, it could be dessert. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. so, so I like I like cereal. I understand. And, and as an as an adult, I still do. But what I don't really like is the fact that 
when I get up at 11.30, 12 o'clock, and I'm hankering for a midnight snack, grabbing something with as much sugar that's in a lot of the regular brands is is not something I want to do. Right. So that's where Magic Spoon comes in. So everybody's trying to eat healthy. Everybody's trying to eat better. You don't. It doesn't mean your breakfast has, has to be boring, or that you have to give up that childhood fla- uh, favorite cereal. Magic Spoon has all the flavors you love, but without all the bad stuff. That's right. It's got zero grams of sugar, thirteen to fourteen grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs in each serving, and only one hundred and forty calories per serving. And that's great for me and Ashley because we're going to the gym all the time and I actually gave a box to my grandmother. My grandmother is, you know, she's got to eat healthy for, I mean she's over 80 years old so the doctor has told her, look you, you, you need to eat a little bit healthier quit eating all the sugars, cut your carbs down, only have those you know, at certain points of the day stuff like that. So she doesn't get to eat the cereals as much anymore. So I said, hey, why don't you try a box of Magic Spoon? And I let her try some. I let her try some of the maple waffle. And Mm -hmm. she loved it. She's like, okay, you've got me hooked. It's my all-time favorite now. Yeah, I love it. It's great. Um, It's also keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, and low-carb. So if you're into doing any of that, then they've got your back. You can build your own box. The available flavors to build your very own custom bundle are cocoa, fruity, frosted, peanut butter, blueberry, cinnamon, cookies and cream, and maple waffle. So the ones that they've brought back that you may go, hey, I didn't hear those on your last Magic Spoon ad, are the cookies and cream and the maple waffle. And they've brought those back permanently. They had them at one point. They brought them back permanently because everybody loved them. And... You know, I I agree. I I like both of those flavors very much. The maple waffle is great. Uh, The peanut butter is one of my favorites, but I also like the fruity flavor. Yeah. Fruity is good, and I I really like the cinnamon. Yeah. Because my my all-time favorite cereal is a cinnamon cereal, and this one is great. Right. So if you want to join in on the Magic Spoon train here with us uh, in you know, me, Matt, and my grandmother, then you can go to magicspoon.com slash grave and grab a custom bundle of cereal to try today. Be sure to use our promo code grave, that's G-R-A-V-E, at checkout to save $5 off your order. That's right. Just go to magicspoon.com slash grave to get a custom bundle of cereal and try it today. Be sure to use our promo code GRAVE, G-R-A-V-E, at checkout to save $5 off your order. And remember, Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. That's great. Matt, that's all I've got for the intro and all Jeez, my... that was enough. I know, right? <laughs> I talked way more this time than last time. You went on for 22 minutes without talking about the topic at all. I hope this topic is worth it. So it may not be. It probably won't be, but you know. <laughs> no, so, it, it's going to be fun. So Matt, tell us, what are we talking about tonight, brother? Okay, so I I tried to come up with a way to introduce this topic uh, that was kind of, you know, fun and intriguing, and so I I couldn't. So <laughs> here it is. It's uh we're tonight we're gonna talk about sky fish mm-hmm. or or flying rods, air rods, um any any of those terms apply, and I know a lot of people are going. What in the hell is he talking about? Because that's what I said when Adam brought this up. I was like, what? I was like, Skyfish. I said, I think there's a video game called Skyfish. Um, but, but, but Skyfish or flying rods, 
air rods, whatever, and there's other names too, were discovered in the late 1990s. People found that on some type, some film, uh, everything from home videos to movies uh, that were seen in theaters had these strange disturbances that looked like blurry rods Mm -hmm. flying through certain areas. Um, and they were kind of white looking, but the one, the one unique thing was that they were so fast, right? You know, so most of these were so fast, they were barely visible. You just, you just had to try and catch one. But people started examining films for these anomalies and they called what they were doing sky fishing because the best way to see them on a film was to catch um, frames where a, a large area of a solid color was prevalent, right. namely the sky. So, like I said, everything, movies, old television shows, uh, videos of sporting events, anything you can think of, people started hunting to try to find these, and and they did, yep, and they did wild. But what what in the world are they? That's what we're going to get into tonight. Exactly, and I've been fascinated with these things since it's been. Many years ago, I, I saw a Monster Quest episode. I don't know if any of y'all remember Monster Quest, but I, I saw a Monster Quest episode where they talked about it. Mm-hmm. Fascinated me. So I had to look into them. So I looked into them a little bit and I thought, you know what? I'm going to throw this out at Matt because I've thought about these things for years and I, I want an excuse to deep dive into these things. So Graveyard Tales has become mine and Matt's excuse to look deeply into things we didn't think we would have time to look into. Yeah. Or didn't even know existed in my case. Yeah, exactly. Um, so as we always say, go check our sources. Um, there's a lot of sources down in the bottom of our show notes. You can find that. And a lot of this info that I'll be quoting um, and I'll let you know when I'm quoting. It comes from Tear Daniels' website. Um, that link is also in the show notes. Um, they had a good synopsis of stuff, and you can go look there. I didn't grab much of the website because they've got a ton, but you can go check that out um, along with our other sources. So let's get into this fascinating topic. Um, you may not find it fascinating, but I find it fascinating, and that's good enough. Um, <laughs> So rods, they're also known as skyfish, like Matt said. I, I, I will refer to them as both of those. Um, but they're, people also call them solar entities or fulgure in French. Um, they're a really new cryptid. So they're a lot like the Fresno nightcrawlers that we just recently discussed. We seem to have picked some newer cryptids, not these things that have been around for centuries, which is in and of itself fascinating to me that even in the past 30, 40 years, we're finding new stuff. Yeah. And the funny thing was we weren't really even trying. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like we didn't go, let's do some shows on the most recent cryptid. Mm-hmm. It just worked out that way. Yep. It just happened to be, um, which that's kind of the way Graveyard Tales works. The synchronicities and the weird Timing and everything that happens in Graveyard Tales amazes me every day. Now, rods, skyfish, they're said to be creatures that fly around in the air at speeds so high that you really can't see them with the naked eye, like Matt was talking about. You you can only see them when you're reviewing videos. Now, there's some discrepancies to that. Um, Some people have noticed them. We may touch on that after a while, but the majority of these things weren't observed at the time. They were only seen later when people were reviewing the video footage. So 
they're called rods or flying rods because of their rod-like shape um, that when they're photographed, you see. So I'll quote the website here. It says, quote, their bodies are shaped like long, thin rods, and their only appendages are wavy wings, one on each side, stretching the full length of, of their bodies. They move through the air by undulating these wings like eels swimming through the water, end quote. So I, I'll, I'll mention it again here in a minute, but think of eels with like membranous things on the side of their body and they move kind of like a squid does where they, mm -hmm. the squid flaps those two little fins on its head. That's mm -hmm. kind of what these are doing is they're like a long eel, but they've got those fins running the entire length of their body. And their undulating movements. I just hit my mic. Sorry about that. <laughs> and and that's the way they seem to be propelling themselves through the air at high rates of speed, which we'll I'll get into that here in a minute too. But it's been argued by a bunch of people that these objects are actually organic. So it's been a topic of debate and and they they've come to the conclusion conclusion many of these people that they are organic they say that they are a living creature and they're not some form of flying saucer but some have said they think they may be a form of extraterrestrial life form since they look totally different from any life forms we have now and they have actually been seen along with ufo activity which We'll talk about as well, but skeptics will say that all of these things are birds, insects, or camera trickery. And we'll, I've said this three times, I think in the past couple of minutes that we'll talk about this later, but we're going to talk about a bunch of crap later. Exactly. Just know that um, <laughs> this being one of them, um, but I, I feel like some of it, may actually be camera issues, but it can't all be. So that's what we'll discuss at the end here. But there's actually a little bit of debate about this next section um, as to who initially filmed the rods. But we do know that there were two different events at about the same time, actually. Now, Matt's got one of them, and then I'll get the next one. So, so this first one is a guy in, uh, in Monterey, Mexico. Uh, named Santiago Utera, and he had been hearing about UFO sightings in the area, so he decided to set up some camera equipment to see if he could catch one of these UFOs on film. Now, after waiting for more than an hour on the 19th of March in 1994, Utera started to, he became restless. He got tired, he was getting bored, and he was just about ready to give up hope but then he spotted a flashing light and started filming. Now, the light disappeared quickly, and he waited around to see if it would come back, but it never did. Of course. So Utura decided he would uh, take down his camera and replay the video to see if he had captured anything on film. When he looked at the film, he could see the strange light of the UFO but then a few frames further on, uh, Utera saw something else. Okay, what? After the UFO had disappeared on the film, Utera noticed the brief appearance of these long, spear like objects which darted across the screen at an incredible speed. Now, after constantly replaying the footage, he realized that this object couldn't be a bird or an insect. In fact, it was moving so fast that it could only be spotted when the film was viewed frame by frame. Right. So here, you know, as Adam said, they move really, really quickly, faster than what the human eye can see. And in this case, um, the one that Santiago Utera filmed moved so fast the camera lens couldn't even keep up, and he actually had to go frame by frame on the video to actually see what it was. Mm -hmm. Now, he knew right then he had gotten something. You know, this is, this is good. This is good. 
and but he wanted to know was it linked to the ufo or was it something totally different so the other one the other uh sighting it around this same time was um talked about on the website so quote the rods were discovered accidentally and first filmed by jose escamilla at midway new mexico on march 19th 1994 Jose Escamilla has promoted video footage of Rods recording uh, Rods recorded during the filming of base jumpers Brandon Daruna and Andrew Bradbury at the Cave of Swallows in Mexico. Now, that film at the Cave of Swallows is considered to be the best footage taken so far of these flying rods. Mm -hmm. Now, Mark Lichtel was a professional cameraman for a U.S. television show. Um, and he was filming these parachutists jumping into the cave of swallows, which, uh, is, uh, San Luis, San Luis Potosi, Mexico. I got it. I flubbed it at first, but I got it. <laughs> now, in most cases, the rods were only noticed when the film was reviewed later, but when they look at the slow motion video, Lichtel saw numerous rods darting in and out of the frame and flying around the base jumpers as they descended through the air. Now, in one shot, a rod avoids colliding with one of the jumpers by veering sharply away at the last second. And that's one thing that I want to talk about when we get to the end of this episode. So keep in mind that incident where a rod veers away quickly and goes around a base jumper that's one point that I, I have to make toward the end to keep quoting this website it says since then many more rods have been captured on film from all over the world one of the key investigators into the rods phenomena is video production company owner jose escamilla so far, Escamilla, who is in charge of a team of independent investigators, has obtained spectacular footage of photographs from a wide range of countries, including the UK, Sweden, Canada, Norway, Mexico, and the USA. Rods are claimed to have been spotted in the US, Australia, Canada, Mexico, Europe, Philippines, and China as well, um, even though they, they don't have the footage of some of those. They have the footage of the first group. That second group, they don't necessarily have good footage of, but they claim to have been seen. Now, this keeps saying, uh, keeps going with Escamilla claims to even have footage of rods underwater. So it's not only an air thing, mm -hmm. but apparently these can go from air to water. And at the Cave of Swallows, there was a documentary talking about it and Jose is being interviewed. And one of the investigators says um, that the cave of swallows seems to be a hub, like a nesting ground for these rods. Mm -hmm. And the reason he thinks is because it's like a cenote. Um, so a big hole in the earth with water down there. And it's a tube that goes to other holes in the earth. Um, a lot of y'all probably know what cenotes are, but he thinks that they live around that area because they can easily transition between air and water. And this is a place that has both in a small contained area where they can stay hidden and feel protected. You know, a lot of, um, a lot of animals, flying animals like, um, well, swallows for one, but bats and everything else also live in areas like this because of that. They they are able to stay protected. So why wouldn't, if this is an organic being, why wouldn't they as well? But Escamilla's discovery has been controversial since he went public with it. Now, he states that his evidence shows why rods or something other than insects, birds, or problems with camera artifacts or shutter speed, um, which is what many of the insect theorists claim. And Matt's got some stuff a little bit later on the insect theorist, which I have my problems with, believe it or not. 
I know it's weird that I would have problems with debunking <laughs> theories, but I was fixed to say, is it, is anybody surprised that Adam has a problem <laughs> with the insect theory? Yeah, I mean, it's it's not that I have a problem with people trying to debunk things. It's that every time we talk about someone debunking things, I, who am not a highly educated man at all, can poke holes in it very easily. So why are these supposed experts picking weird explanations for things that my dumb butt can poke holes in, right? You would think that if these were experts and they had a good theory, I wouldn't go, oh, well, here's the five problems with it that I just thought of offhand. Mm -hmm. Give me a minute and I'll have five more. That I would go, yeah, that that sounds logical. That makes sense to to my my layman brain. Yeah. But if if my dumb butt is able to find that many problems with it, I, I don't think it's it's a good explanation. And and that's why that's why I get so animated and angry about some of these debunking things. Yeah. But you know, I I I think there's there's a good reason um that you're able to poke so many holes in these theories that are developed by intelligent people. And it's because these intelligent people, I say in quotes, they're not interested in finding out anything more than a, a theory that will debunk anything that's, you know, paranormal, cryptozoological, anything yep. like that. Yep. So once they have one that they're satisfied with, they're done. The sure, research yeah. is complete in their mind and they go no further. So if it's plausible to them and they can move on, that's what they do. You know, they, they debunk it and they move on to the next thing. Yeah. Why quote You're, unquote waste any more of their time? Correct. So they're not going to keep digging to find a better explanation. They're going to find one that they like, and this is going to be it. And that's the case in with this insect theory, which, you're going to see why. I mean, it's not like they just, it, it's better than the, it's an owl theory. Oh, I, yeah, absolutely. I assure you, it's way better than that. Yep. Um, and but, I can actually kind of understand this one a little bit yeah. where I can't with the owl thing. But yeah. But I think a lot of it is the people that are really doing the research are the ones that believe it, it's something else. But they're also the ones that, the scientific community are looking at going, yeah, you're nuts. Why are yeah. you spending any more time or resources on this? Yeah. Well, if we don't, we're never really going to know. Exactly. If we leave it up to them, it, it's going to go unresearched. Mm -hmm. So we have to do the research. So this says, quote, Jose Escamilla is from Roswell, New Mexico, and when he decided to put together the website, the name Rods.com was already taken. So he decided to register Roswell Rods because Roswell is, in fact, his hometown and the place where he filmed some of these rods. And the website, the website presents evidence collected over the many years of research, and since that day in 1994, over 48 million people have visited the website and thousands have submitted photos, video clips, and written reports from experiences they have had with rods. What is extraordinary about most of the written reports submitted by people from all walks of life are that some of them have relayed information that only Jose Escamilla and his team of researchers had found out for themselves. Information that has never been released to the public started coming in from reports made by eyewitnesses from different parts of the world. So that's fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. That it's like in a, a, a murder investigation, you don't give out all the information. That way, if somebody comes to you and relays something, you can go, wait, I didn't give that out. You know more than you're saying, or you're actually credible because you know this and I've never 
release this information, so only somebody who was there would yeah. know this. Or you're the killer. Yeah, exactly. So that's kind of what's happening with this is he's not releasing all of the information that he knows and it's coming back to him from eyewitness reports. So that kind of lends a little validity to this argument. And the other thing about this that surprises me is there are thousands of people who have submitted photos and everything, yet this is not a worldwide topic being talked about it was picked up a little bit in the 90s there's been a show here or there that has talked about it but it's not something that like bigfoot we're getting reports of you know, Can canadian news is doing reports on somebody who saw a bigfoot in some small town they're not doing oh hey we got rods here mm -hmm. so I don't know why. I think it mainly because of the debunkers that we'll talk about have convinced everybody that it's artifacts. It, it's video artifacts or video trickery. So they're like, eh, that's nothing. You know, we're not, we're not going to give it the time of day. But since we're talking about what it could be, what people say it is, let's look at some possible explanations like different rod theories and speculations. And even, even though there's a lot of people with differing opinions on all the footage of these rods, there have been some close examination done of the videos. And this examination has uncovered quite a few consistencies. Now analysis has shown that the rods look like they're cylinder shaped creatures or something like that. And they have, they range in length from 10 centimeters to three meters. So that's three inches to nine to 10 feet. Mm -hmm. So wide range of sizes. They're not all the same size. And they seem to be able to travel at speeds of up to 300 kilometers per hour. So that's upwards of 186 to 187 miles per hour. Now, I'm just going to say this right now. The fastest bug that we know of is the dragonfly. And I think they said it flies about 40 something miles an hour. So I, I won't say anymore. Just keep that in mind when we start talking about <laughs> insect theories. If the fastest bug we know of is the dragonfly and these things are moving at 187 miles per hour, just let that sink in for a little bit. Well, they seem to fly by making some undulating motion with a solid membrane that's on the sides of their bodies. This membrane seems to move or vibrate at a high rate of speed. It's been said that it's similar to how squids move, like um, I was talking about a minute ago, by the way they flap their fins on their bodies. So that, that's similar to these rods. Now, quote, in 1997, Escamilla attempted to gain scientific recognition of the phenomena by taking a selection of his footage to zoologists and entomologists from the University of Colorado. They were totally baffled, states Escamilla. All they could say was that it was unlike anything they had ever seen and that it deserves further study. Biologist Ken Swartz has been investigating the Rods phenomena since 1998 and says rods appear to be biological, but without a physical specimen, it is difficult to say anything conclusively. They seem to be amphibious as they have been seen entering and leaving water. Perhaps they are born in the sea and emerge into the air? Question mark. Speculating from the eyewitness testimony of people who have seen them, Schwartz maintains that they appear to have some similarities to the family of creatures known as cephalopods, such as squids. There have been descriptions of them expanding like a balloon and rapidly deflating, he states. So they could be using a mechanism similar to a squid, which sucks in water and jets it out for propulsion, end quote. So that's interesting. 
his theory is that maybe they are amphibious, like at the Cave of Swallows, like Escamilla has said he's seen them underwater. So what if first part of their life they're underwater and then they come out to do whatever they have to do? Mm -hmm. So one thing that people argue is that if they're actual creatures flying around us all the time, then why haven't we found bodies of these creatures? Well, it's the same kind of argument that we see when we discuss Bigfoot or other cryptids. Well, quote, Schwartz explains that if the rods are indeed similar to squid, they will not have any hard body parts and so could decompose without a trace. Schwartz points out, if you look at the fossil record, there's only one creature that ever lived that had the rod mode of locomotion, and this was the dominant predator of the time called Animalacris, which lived in the sea during the Cambrian evolutionary expansion 400 million years ago. According to Schwartz, the creature propelled itself by a row of plates or fins that vibrated in a similar manner to the membrane seen on rods. It is possible that animal lacris is the evolutionary ancestor of the rods. And I'm about to talk about that too. But Adam, let's take a minute and talk about one of tonight's sponsors, Best Fiends. Now, you may be kicking back this summer, you know, enjoying, you know, the 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 last bit of heat and sunshine and just hanging out just trying to to rejuvenate and refresh well sometimes your brain needs a little bit of rejuvenating and refreshing from the, the stress of the day you know work kids any of that stuff and maybe you just need to take a break and play best fiend so right now i'm challenging myself to try to beat you know 10 levels every week Right. And it's not it's not going well. <laughs> <laughs> and and trust me, you know, I'll 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 pull up and have about, you know, five or ten minutes to spare and I'm whipping out my phone and I'm trying to beat, you know, another level and I may spend my whole time and never do it. You know, it took me a it took me a day and a half to beat one the you know, last week. Mm-hmm. Well, and, you know, that's because you and I are not as smart as Ashley and Amanda. Um, if, if we were as smart as they were, we would be a lot further along. But we still enjoy playing the game, even though we're not as good as our spouses are. But, like, for me, when I go to pick up Michael after school, I got to get there at, you know, a, a good amount early for pickup. Otherwise, all the other parents are going crazy in front of me and I can't actually get there to pick him up because for some reason school pickup is a nightmare. So I get there early and I just have to sit. So instead of just sitting there being bored and watching other parents inability to park, I'll actually pull out the game and start playing Best Fiends because it helps pass time and, and it's a good way to kind of escape that I, I, weirdness of kid pickup time it, it gets me into the world of killing slugs and and matching you know the the color matching game and stuff like that so it's fun and if you want to join us in this you can download the five star rated puzzle game best fiends for free today on the apple app store or google play that's friends without the r best fiends that's right. You can go and download the five-star rated puzzle game Best Fiends free today on the App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends. There are different possibilities here that have been put out by different people, and they were compiled together. Um, so I'm going to read the arguments for each one here in their own words. Now, Animalacris was put forth not only by Schwartz, but by Jim Peters. And he says, Animalacris was the largest creature on the planet when it lived 525 million years ago during the Cambrian evolutionary explosion. Fossils in Canada 
are up to two feet in length. Some in China are larger. Animal lacris was so successful at the top of the food chain that it survived for 20 million years. Animal lacra shares some of the basic physical characteristics that we think rods possess with its long body and fins running down the middle of the sides of its body. Today, we can see the efficiency of this propulsion method in cuttlefish. Being predators, animal lacras and cuttlefish are agile and quick. So I'll, I'll try to post some pictures they have of the animal lacras on um, Patreon there so you can see those, but you can also look them up. Now, one of the other ones is the Proto-Terra Goats uh, that was put forth by Dave Blackburn. This was featured on the History Channel's Monster Quest. So this is one that I saw on that episode. It says, quote, the day after Jose and Jim Peters flew to London in November, I found Stephen Dalton's book, The Miracle of Flight. It was there that I began to learn of the work of Professor Robin J. Wooten of Exeter University. In the book on page 39 is where I found the strobe flash time lapse photo of the physical model of Proto Terragote that was built and photographed by Dalton. Wooten drew a picture of what he deduced the Proto Terragote must have looked like, and Dalton constructed a physical model that matched Wooten's paleo entomological vision. So I think synthesized the notions that the rods that are being filmed and, and videoed by Jose and his associates around the world are the modern day descendants of the primitive proto pteragotes Entomologists led by Wooten and his colleagues explain that proto pteragotes are the extinct missing link that had to exist emerging sometime during the 70 million year period between the emergence of crawling insects and the emergence of winged insects. According to Dr. Robin Wooten, a rod is a proto a hypothetical ancestor of today's insects. This is the model um, that Wooten built. Um, so I'll put that in Patreon as well, but think of a tube with flaps on the side of it. That's yeah. what a proto pterygote is. So we've got, now that we've got a little bit of that and we've got some thoughts on maybe what they could be, animal lacrys, proto pterygotes, or something different, we need to go into the theories and the debunks here of what this could be. Okay. So theory proponents say that there is no possibility that the flying rods can be known objects. So it's got to be something that we haven't discovered yet. Yeah. I'd say now, I lean that way too. Now, all of the evidence centers around the photographs uh, and the flying rods that are caught on tape and on film. Now, there are also non-photographic pieces of evidence like ancient cave drawings that can be depicted as the flying rods, but no one, and I mean really no one, has shown the desire to make an active case for the evidence so it really, as Adam said, it doesn't get laid, it gets overlooked. Okay? I mean, you know, Escamila is the leader in this. And it's just it's just been kind of dismissed. Yep. And well, he's a, a video editor. He's not a scientist. That's right. That's so right. you know, he's just it, he's just the one that that you know witnessed and published this phenomenon and you know now now he's you know the 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 expert on flying rods. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, but but since the evidence is based on only the video and photographs, the theory of this phenomenon isn't well supported because the evidence is flawed. Now, let me tell you what I mean by that. With the motion blue effect of quote fins on a flying rod. It's consistent with an insect beating its wings very quickly. So here we are. This is the insect theory that we're talking about. And the so reason you finish that, and then I'll tell you my argument. Okay. So the re the reason they determine that the evidence is flawed is because they've determined that in at at certain uh, shutter speeds, 
an insect beating its wings flying along a path will produce a very similar image. Now, after analyzing the footage, it's clear that the objects can't be possibly as big as they're reported to be, uh, or they could be easily seen without the use of camera equipment. And in addition, it, they say it just isn't possible for video to be able to capture something like this without it being visible to the naked eye. Investigators propose that rods are just tricks of light, which result from how images, mainly video images, are recorded and played back. In particular, the fast passage before the camera of an insect flapping its wings has been shown to produce a rod-like effect due to motion blur if the camera is shooting with relatively long exposure times, as, as I mentioned earlier. So when you, you know, I think most people understand how a camera shutter works. You know, it, it, you've, you've got a closed, a, a, an opening that's, that's closed, and it's going to open up and let in light, okay? If it's a film camera, it, the light is going to hit the film, okay, and, and create the image. If it's a digital camera, it's going to do the same thing. It's just not going to produce, you know, the hard image. It's going to be translated into pixels, and you get the image there. The image you get is based on how much light comes into the lens while the shutter is open. So everybody has tried to take a picture of somebody running or a fast car and you get them developed and you look at them and you're like, eh, it's nothing but a bunch of blurry lines. It's because the shutter stayed open too long and it right. captured and it captured whatever it was at several points in time before the shutter closed. Okay, that that causes a blurred effect. So what this insect theory is saying is if there is a very quick moving moth beating its wings, flying in all directions past the camera. OK. It's moving fast enough that when you look at the video. You're going to see that blur effect and it's going to have the appearance that the up and down wings are giving it an undulating appearance. Okay. Any kind of video, it's absolutely going to be undulating up and down, but it, it's nothing more than that. And that would be why you wouldn't necessarily see it with the naked eye is because you wouldn't necessarily notice a moth flying by, or there may be tons and they're just moths and you're not paying attention to them. But then when you watch the video, you're not thinking about picking up all these insects you're thinking about whatever it is you're filming and you see these things i i can see that on some but here's my argument if if it is slow shutter speed on a camera then it would show up on still footage right but it would be a long, like it, it would go the length of the the frame. It would start mm -hmm. outside the frame, and then you would see a tube kind of moving up and down, and then the undulating thing of the wings, mm -hmm. right? If it was a video, let's say a long exposure night shot, then, and you see that, you do see this, a moth comes into frame, but it's a long, windy trail of this, and it's wrapping around, moving around, going up and down and everything. The rods are, they have a stop and a start to them. And this stop and start, this whole tube moves through the frame in different areas. Mm -hmm. It's not one long tube going the whole length of the, the video which is what you would see if it was an insect moving like that. So the, it's not like the, the moth flaps for this foot long thing and then it teleports 15 inches in front of it and then starts flapping again, creating a space in between. The, mm -hmm. They're separate, you know, moving that way as a tube. It's not an entire strip of moth flying. So, 
that's one of my issues with it. The other is we're not talking about just on still video cameras. We're not talking about just on night cameras. We're talking about high def digital cameras that people are using to film skydivers and stuff like that. So you want a fast shutter speed. You want fast frame rate to be able to catch these divers clearly diving into the cenote or you're seeing them on major motion pictures. People have caught them on major motion pictures. They're not using crazy cheap slow shutter speed cameras that would cause a, a motion blur of an insect. They're using high definition film cameras mm -hmm. and they're still getting rods moving through the frame. Right. And then think about what we're talking earlier, the diver and a rod came and dodged around the diver, the skydiver to avoid hitting it. You would see the diver blurred out in a long, like it would be a long tube of a diver and a long tube of a moth going around it, but the diver would pass the moth before it even got to there. Which means this thing is flying fast. They mm -hmm. have calculated the speed of these things and it flies faster than any insect we've got. So I don't see how you can put all that evidence together and then come back with it's a moth. It's a bug on a on a frame, a weird frame camera thing. It's been on so many different cameras. It doesn't act like a bug would act. You've got multiple of these things seen in the the same video footage, and they're dancing around. And I still say, if it was a moth, you would just see tracers, S shapes, and circles, and everything in mm -hmm. front of the diver, the skydiver. You wouldn't see a skydiver perfectly clear going down, and then a foot long rod flitting around in in frame mm -hmm. I, I i just don't see how you can put all that together and say ah yeah it's just a bug and a bad camera yeah it doesn't make any sense to me well the debunkers explain it this way it says uh while while the central rod is actually a time-lapse image of the body it shows the full distance traveled during the field exposure time the effect is more pronounced with large, long-bodied insects, which have broad wings and fairly slow wing beats, such as mantises or grasshoppers or katydids, um, or, or insects that have completely opaque wings like moths. Now, on video equipment, equipment which resolves the two interlaced fields of a single video frame, which are captured successfully, uh, successively and then displayed as alternating horizontal lines, the rod effect uh, can be uh, seen to alternate from one field to the other, producing the distinctive gaps between the successive images. So this is how they explain the gaps, where it looks like they're, as Adam said, it would just look like one long thing. This, the way the video is rendered, is, is their attempt to explain why you would see the gaps, making it look like there's multiples of them flying behind one another. Now, similar results can be used by using standard film if, as we said, there's a long enough exposure and or a, a strobe light effect which lasts more than a single wing beat. In other words, you can produce the rod effect with the right equipment, lighting, and subject. Okay, so we're we're going we're going in this in this particular direction with this insect theory now on august 8th and 9th of 2005 china central television aired a two-part documentary about flying rods in china it reported the events from may to june of that year at tonga zingu pharmaceutical company in tongua city in the jilin province which debunked the flying rods this is how they did it. 
Surveillance cameras in the facility's compound captured video footage of flying rods identical to those shows in, sh- shown in Jose Escamilla's video. Now, getting no good answer to the phenomenon, the scientists at the facility decided that they would try and figure out how to, you know, what it was and attempt to catch these creatures. So huge nets were set up. And the same surveillance cameras then captured images of rods flying into the trap. When the nets were inspected, the rods were just regular moths and other ordinary insects. So later later investigations proved that the appearance of the flying rods on video was an optical illusion created by the slower recording speed of the camera. Now, this represents empirical evidence which shows that the rods themselves can be captured and that they are indeed ordinary insects. And this documentary also addressed claims that rods were capable of flying at speeds impossible for insects, showing that video cameras cannot be used accurately to measure speed if the distance from the lens to the moving objects cannot be determined. So, in, in short, what they're saying is that this isn't a a trick of light. This isn't a, oh, look, if you, you know, this is a hoax, okay? That's what it's saying. You know, it, it's saying that this is how we did it. This is how we think other people could do it. It's not that difficult. You use a slow shutter speed, and this is what you're going to get, and we did it, and look, it was insects. Okay, this is the way I feel about this one. That was insects. And they had to set up equipment that was designed to capture exactly that. Okay. Exactly. So they were going after this elongated um, image, a blur image of an insect, knowing it would probably look like the rods that they saw on the security camera. Now, my problem with it is, number one, they used a slow shutter speed, and Adam was already talking about if if you're filming guys base jumping into the cave of swallows, you are not going to use a slow shutter speed. Nope. Okay. Otherwise, your subject, the parachute jumpers, they're going to be blurred. Yep. Okay. So if you're using uh, high speed equipment, then why would you catch this blur? Yep, exactly. I mean, you know, that's problematic to me. And then in the other case of, of the, the fact that they caught them on security cameras, who, uh, who has a security camera that captures high-speed video? I know mine don't. No. I mean, I can, I can watch live somebody walk across my yard and, and tell that it's, somewhat delayed mm-hmm. i mean it's not a perfectly smooth stream by no means i mean i can see movement but it's it's it doesn't even capture it as good as my webcam does right but it, well, and- it does the job but but the thing is if, if these are the two cameras in china that they use to capture these things neither one of them were high speed enough to be able yep. to say this is indeed a, a, an effect that's caused by film by by just insects and like you said they were going after that so they set it up intentionally to look like that mm-hmm. so they made their outcome they went in with this is what we're going to do and you can't always take that credibly when someone says yeah i mean i'm going after this result and I'm going to prove this result. You you have to go into it saying, I'm going to film this, and then whatever happens, happens. Yeah. But giving Escamilla the benefit of the doubt, he is a video editor. So he would understand the slow shutter speed, the that, blurring effect. And that's a, that's a fantastic point. He knows the speed of these cameras probably better than we do. And he would know, okay, this is not something weird because this is a motion blur. 
But if you're filming them in relation to things quickly moving that are not blurred, you can't tell me it's motion blur, just motion blurring these tiny little insects there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And them saying, well, you can't, if you don't know the distance between the camera and the thing, then you can't tell how fast they're moving. Well, there's a, a drone video of a guy who caught a rod on his drone video camera, high definition, you know, it's a 4K drone video camera. And he normally does like, what what is it? Not landscape, but he goes out and he films different natural areas in 4K with his drone flying above, you know, like Natural Geographic does and stuff like that. And he was filming something and he went through the process of breaking down how he determined the speed of this thing because he knew the distance between his his camera and the tree that it flew past. And he knew where it was in relation to that. A bird had just flown by and he saw that and it didn't blur out. Mm -hmm. And this thing he calculated at about 60 something miles an hour going through. So he was able to do the math and figure out the the speed of it. Mm -hmm. I just, I, I think, yes, the motion blur can explain some, but it would explain some on security cameras, on night vision cameras, stuff like that. But it's it's not going to explain the high definition cameras that these have been caught on. Yeah. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna stomp on Adam's uh, theory. I know by saying this, and he he may want to chime in, but um, so let's say for example, you're using high speed equipment. It's not necessarily has to be high def. It has to be high speed. Okay. So it's got to be able. It's got to be able to capture. Images that are moving very quickly um, without, you know, blurring them out. Okay. So let's say you're, you're, you've got this high speed camera. You, you film, you film a, a NASCAR. Okay. And you, you've got that camera that's right there on the start finish line. And those cars are coming through anywhere from 150 to 180 miles an hour. Okay, so here they go. They blur a little bit. Okay, a little bit at a, at a still camera. If the camera is not moving, they will blur a little bit. Okay, but you can still make out what it is. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you're using the same high speed equipment and you're filming and you catch these rods, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it make sense to think that if it's that high quality of of a camera would you not be able to pick out what it is i mean yeah would even if so let's say if it's a moth if it's a a, a grasshopper or a katie did how fast do those things fly not as fast as not as fast as a dragonfly no so let's say you're 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 filming a dragonfly at 40 miles an hour guess what it's not gonna do it's not gonna blur yeah, and like you said, if you've got a strip of motion blur, at the very end of that strip, you'll see a dragonfly. Mm -hmm. You'll see the body of the dragonfly, or at least enough that you can pick out, oh yeah, that's a dragonfly, that's an insect. Because, like the NASCAR um, analogy, there may be a motion blur behind it, but at the very end of that motion blur, you go, oh hey, that's a NASCAR. Mm -hmm. I, I see it. it. It's a car. I can tell. Sure, it looks like the rest of it's blurred out. It's like if you'll, you're filming your dog running across the yard, you may get 15 legs running across, but then at the end, you get a picture of your dog. Yeah. But it just has 15 legs coming out behind it. Yeah. So it's not going to completely change or completely wash out the image if you're using a decent camera. 
which a lot of these are on decent cameras, and it's not going to make it look like it's a a finite end to this thing, a flat mm-hmm. finite end of the deal without having some kind of identifiable feature to it. Yeah. So, like I said, I understand this can happen on some, and I know people will say, "Well, I've I've seen it, and it has been moths out." Yeah. If you've got a, a deer camera out in the thing and it picks up some motion, it's night vision. It's not high quality. It's slow shutter speed because it's at night to pick up a lot of light. So, yes, things are going to blur. But you're going to be able to tell this is an insect mm-hmm. or something of that nature. So I, I don't think this explains all of them. I don't. I will not except that as a blanket answer for everything that's considered a rod. Yeah. Especially if you're photographing this thing going in and out of the water. How many dragonflies do you know that pop in and out of water like that? They may land on water, yeah. but they're going to land on it. And then you go, oh, hey, it's a dragonfly. It landed on water. But there is one that does. And Anthony Westcamper uh, took photos of mayflies along the Van Dusen River Mm -hmm. and was able to successfully reproduce photos of flying rods using long, again, using a long exposure. Yep. Intentionally going after long exposure. Intentionally using a a slower shutter speed. Now, if you know anything about mayflies and, and, you know, I got up close and personal with about a million of them this weekend (laughs) um, being out on the boat. Yep. um, Though I had no problem at all seeing mayflies with my naked eye yep okay i saw a ton of them but what they do is their larval stage is spent in the water okay and once they're ready they emerge from the water and take off yep okay so if you happen to catch a hatching and saw a ton of them just come up out of the water and you took a picture at a long exposure, then that's probably what you would get. Okay? Mm-hmm. Mayflies are small. They have, you know, translucent wings. Um, you know, you wouldn't necessarily be able to pick it out of a motion blur. Um, you know, so sure. I mean, he was able to reproduce this and it, and it does kind of fit with all the, you know, they've, they've seen them coming out of water and all. Okay. So now they're all mayflies. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but again, it, it's the, uh, that whole, I'm going to purposefully take this photograph with a long exposure, mm-hmm. knowing that that's what it's going to produce. Again, yep. they're not trying to capture flying rods. They're trying to debunk flying rods. Yep. But again, if you're going to go into it and you're going to use a long exposure and you're going to say, this is what it's got to be then you are not saying these other people are mistaken. You're saying that these other people are hoaxers. Hoaxing. Yep, they're hoaxing. Because they would be purposefully using the same scenario with a long shutter shutter, uh, exposure and that knowing full well, like you said, you know, Escamilla is a video editor. He knows full well what would happen if he did that. So I just, I don't know. I mean, it, it, this would, this would be a long way to take a hoax. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. And And you would have to say that all of these videos that you see out there are hoaxes, mm -hmm. but I go back to, if you're going to use a long shutter speed for something, everything else in or long shutter exposure, I mean, um, slow shutter speed, then everything else moving in your video is going to be blurred as well. Right. You can't set, oh, I want these objects captured with a quick shutter speed, a quick exposure, but I want the rest of it to be captured with a, a long exposure. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. So everything in your photo, you would have a man-sized blur 
like a man sized rod mm-hmm. and then moth sized rods. I just I don't I don't see that as being the blanket explanation. And I hate that they keep putting it as a blanket explanation because you're basically brushing it off and like you said, calling all these people hoaxers, mm-hmm. not mistaken you are saying they are intentionally faking this footage and putting it out there yeah simply because you could do it but the only way you could do it was to fake it yep exactly so you know there's there's a there's a lot of ways that people have gone about to try to produce these images um but especially with that video from the cave of swallows i don't buy it I, I, nope. I, that's the one that's the one video that I always will go back to and go this is the, that's why they say it's the best because it it's it's got to be the gold standard because you've got so many frames of reference you know you've got yep. items in focus you've got um you've got moving people in focus and yet you birds got, as well you birds yet you still see the rods so like just like Adam said if you're if you're gonna if you're gonna do this, and you're going to slow that shutter speed down to try to create that effect with insects. Everything else is going to blur, too, that's moving. And nothing yep. else in that video blurs. Nope. All right. So let's say that you take all of that and you come to the conclusion that flying rods are not insects. There's something else. When you open that door... These theories take a, a huge turn, okay? Yep. So so let's go over a few of them, and then, and then I know Adam's got a theory, and it may be one of these, but he's going to talk more about it. So these flying rods may not be made of matter, which would mean that that would explain why they're not uh, they're not visible to the naked eye, but you can catch them on on film. The next one. Why you can't find bodies? Yeah. And you don't find bodies. Flying rods are made of electromagnetic fluxes or some other form of energy. I don't hate this theory. I don't either. Okay. I mean, it, 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 it kind of shades in the direction that, that I would, I would be more apt to go. I'll believe this over the insect thing. Paranormal, like it's a, it's an energy being, like mm-hmm. we believe some paranormal stuff is. Right. Then some say uh, that flying rods are made of some undiscovered fifth phase of matter, other than solid, liquid, glass, and pla- uh, glass. <laughs> well, glass is matter. <laughs> solid, liquid, gas, and plasma. Okay, maybe. I think that one is maybe. a little bit of a stretch. Now, this one, if uh, if flying rods could have evolved from the organisms that are native to clouds. Okay. Uh, cloud I, beings. Okay. Cloud, cloud beings, cloud creatures, some type of some type of living organism. There, there have been. There have been theories put out there that in our upper atmosphere, there are creatures that live in our upper atmosphere that have been captured at some points that apparently some uh, astronauts have seen while going through that some of these high flying jet pilots have seen that there are creatures that live in the upper atmosphere that are not like the creatures that live on earth they never land yeah so if we're going along that theory i don't know that i would call it like a cloud being like it's made out of the same stuff clouds are but if we're thinking that that may be the case that there are entities in our upper atmosphere maybe maybe yeah now this last one is my favorite but it it may be the the least plausible Air rods or flying rods may be tears in reality or condensed strings, which, you know, that string theory is the, a theoretical physical entity posited by the string theory of physics. 
you know, so pick one. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, there's, they're all, all over the map. Um, Yep. Uh, you know, although, you know, this one that they're made of electromagnetic, electromagnetic fluxes or energy is one that I, I tend to lean toward. I don't think that one's as crazy. Um, but because we don't know, uh, and because the only evidence we really have is is video and photographs, it's it's extremely difficult to study these things. One of... There's one theory out there that they are alien beings that have like tagged along or been released from UFOs, maybe. Um, well, I've, one I've thing, seen where they thought they were either an actual alien creature or yep. some new form of of spacecraft. Yeah, like a, know, a drone or something. Yeah, bo- I've seen yep. both. You know, theories posted so. What what I kind of lean toward, and this may, uh, some people may go, oh, that's just as improbable as the string theory thing, but or the cloud being thing. I, I think we all know that I am and Matt are of the theory that there are parallel universes that smash up against ours. And if we're going to take my stack of pancakes theory of universes, then we do have some that are touching our universe at all times. There's a possibility that the universe that is touching us interacts with us on a regular basis, but because they are out of sync is a, is the best way I can think to put out of phase with our universe running on a different electrical grid type thing Mm -hmm. that they may be in the same area as us but we can't see them so there is there is a realm all around us that is interacting with nature and and everything but we we don't ever see them we don't know they're there so what if the rods are actually a creature from that universe that are phasing in and out of our universe. They may not look like rods in their universe, but that's how we see them as they're flying through our universe. Or it always comes back to Fey realm for me. Mm -hmm. What, what if this is something in the Fey realm that, Again, we can't see. We don't know is there, but we catch glimpses of, just like we catch glimpses of other fey entities, and we have stories of these fey entities that interact with us and mess with our houses or or, uh, create good fortune for us or help us out or something like that. What if if this is the same thing? It's in the fey realm. Mm Mm-hmm. And we're just catching small glimpses of what may be a larger entity or this is the entity. It's a rod and that's just how it is, but it's flitting in and out. And the reason we don't ever get bodies is because they don't live here. They're just kind of flying through and then they dart back out through another little rip and go to their, their universe. That's where I land. And that, that may be crazy, but you know, I, I think it it they're around us all the time. We just don't notice them. And occasionally we happen to catch them on video mm-hmm. and see them. And that's why we don't see them with the naked eye. They're slightly out of phase. It's like you see a flash of lightning. Well, if you just see the flash of lightning with the naked eye, it's real quick. Bang. Mm-hmm. Gone. It's a flash. But when you use a camera... You can slow it down and catch it, and you can see it across the screen. What if it's the same way with these things? On a camera, it slows it down just enough where we can actually see it, where we can't with the naked eye. Yeah. Okay, Matt. So we're all adults here, um, and and some of us 
choose to use nicotine to relax, focus, or unwind after a long day. I know you and I do. Um, anybody who watches the video can see us vape on occasion. Um, maybe more than we probably should, but that's beside the point. <laughs> One of our sponsors tonight is Lucy. And Lucy is a um, nicotine company that was created to help nicotine users find a cleaner option and feel better about the ways that they consume nicotine. Their latest product that they have is a slim nicotine pouch and it contains pure synthetic nicotine and it provides the same satisfaction that nicotine users expect without any tobacco at all, which is amazing. Lucy Slim pouches use the newest technology for synthesizing pure nicotine in the lab. None of the tobacco, all of the nicotine satisfaction. Yeah, and I used, I, I used uh, the mango which um, has a, a, a fantastic flavor. Most of these products have either a, a weird, fake, artificial flavor, or they're just so much mint you can't stand. Right, right. This mango, mango was excellent. I had softball practice, okay? So I'm out there, I'm coaching. I, I, can't, I can't be vaping out on, the, out on the field. Right. So I put, I put in uh, one of the Lucy... Uh, pouches and through batting practice did, did my normal routine for practice and it was great you know I didn't have that need to go run off the field and and have a vape right and you know for me it's when we go into um, into a store going shopping or anything like that I don't like crowds as we've talked about before so I nicotine kind of helps me relax in in the crowds well i can't vape walking through a store that's just not cool so i use the slim pouches when i'm walking through a store or if i'm doing some project you know if i'm out there cutting wood sawing stuff up i can't be sitting there vaping while i'm running a, a circular saw so the slim pouches work perfectly for that and you and I both use the four milligram. Well, they actually have four, eight, and 12 milligrams that you can choose from if four is not enough. And they have three exclusive delicious flavors, spearmint, mango, and cool cider. Matt loves the mango. My favorite so far has been the cool cider. It's got a, a, a real interesting, I can't describe it. You'll just have to try it. Uh, it I know, it's, it's neat. It's, it's really hard to describe, but it's great. It, it really is. So if you're like Matt and I and you do like to use nicotine, but, but you know, you're tired of cigarettes or, or even vaping, then you can try Lucy Nicotine, get their slim pouches, and we guarantee that you will like them. So it's 2021. Don't compromise when you're choosing your nicotine products. Go with the newest tobacco-free options from Lucy. Go to lucy.co and use our promo code GRAVE, that's G-R-A-V-E, to get 20% off your order of Lucy Slim Pouches or any other Lucy products. That's right. Graveyard Tales listeners can go to lucy.co, L-U-C-Y dot C-O, and use our promo code GRAVE, G-R-A-V-E, and get 20% off your order of Lucy Slim Pouches or any of the other products they've got. That's lucy.co and use promo code GRAVE at checkout. And we also have to give this disclaimer, Matt. Warning, this product contains non-tobacco nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. Yeah, I, you know, like I said, theories all over the map. Um, you know, really, one explanation is as good as is as good as the next. You know, unless we're talking about string theory. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but what do you guys think? I mean, you know, we've we may have presented a topic here that a lot of you haven't heard of before. Like I said, I know I hadn't. Um, but as you as you dig into this topic a little bit, you realize, okay, it's not as cut and dry as it would seem 
without digging a little deeper. And right. that's what Adam and I learned that it, it, it may be easy to recreate these, this phenomenon on film. Um, but that may not be what's happening when we're talking about the videos that, you know, Jose uh, Escamilla has seen and has taken himself. Right. So what do you guys think? Do you, do you think this is nothing more than just people capturing, you know, fast moving insects on film? Do you think it's a hoax? Uh, or do you think it's something else? Do you think it's, you know, alien in nature? Do you think it's an, an, ener an energy uh, fluctuation that, that, you know, that you can't see with the naked eye, but you may catch on film? Mm -hmm. What do you think? And and the best place to let us know what you think on this is in our Facebook group. And, you know, you go to Facebook, you can search Graveyard Tales. You'll find our group. We're five to 6,000 members strong. Uh, it's a really good place to uh, to interact, you know, find some like-minded people, hear some really cool stories, see some jokes. And um, it, it's it's really, it's probably one of the best groups on Facebook. and. I'm a little biased, I but I but I think so. Um, but you can also find us on Twitter and Instagram. Just go and search Graveyard Tales. And don't forget to rate and review us on iTunes because that is the fastest way that we move up the charts, which makes Adam and I feel good, but it also makes the graveyard easier to find. Mm -hmm. And that while, while you're uh, perusing the internet, you can slide over to our website. It's graveyardpodcast.com. And on our website, you can find links to purchase Graveyard Tales merchandise, like the 8-bit Skull Mike shirt that I'm wearing tonight. Uh, you can listen to the show, and you, you can become a patron. And as Adam mentioned early, you know, our $10 patrons get the vid video without ads uh, of us recording the show. You get to see all of our flubs, all of our mistakes. You get to see us hanging out, talking back and forth. You get to see me flip Adam a bird. You know, and all this, all this other, you know, fun and hilarity that ensues um, behind the scenes, so to speak. Well, I think we've about covered Skyfish as as well as we could, Adam. I think so. I think we covered it more than most would have probably wanted us to. <laughs> That's right. But we did it anyway, dang it. So until next time, we'll save you a seat in the graveyard. See you soon. It's like a softball coming at me. Yep. Slow and steady, but it still hits you right in the face. <laughs> well, you lean in because you think, maybe not. Maybe it's going to take a curve at <laughs> yeah. the end. Maybe, maybe don't. Maybe something will happen. No. <laughs> like that joke. I... Um, I, I saw this frisbee being thrown at the beach, and I couldn't figure out why it kept getting closer to me, and then it hit me. <laughs>